Genesis 18, from 1 to 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to the tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sears of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, Yes, you did laugh. This is the reading of his word. All right. Um, Well, um, it says uh, the Bible tells us that uh, Jesus, I mean the Lord, uh, the Lord God sits in heaven on his throne and our prayers go up to him like an aroma. Uh, Revelation says he breathes in our prayers. Why don't we start by praying this morning? Father, we, we don't want to take this moment lightly. Um, we don't want to take this moment where, we, where we've come to you lightly. We don't want to take you lightly. Um, after all, you are the creator of this world. You are the creator of this heaven, of, of the heavens and the earth. Um, you, are, you created us. Um, to be your people. And so, Lord, just as we get into your word, won't you help us? Won't you give us understanding? And uh, help me. Help me, Lord, um, to perform for an audience of one, which is you. Help me to be faithful in my words and help me to, and give me the words so that your people might benefit greatly. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So promises. Promises play a very prominent role in our society today. Wouldn't you agree? Now, what's the biggest promise that you've ever made anybody? Can you recall that? Biggest promise you've ever made anyone? I'll tell you mine. Uh, the biggest promise I've made anyone is to my wife, uh, Pelisa. Uh, my wife and I uh, stood in front of a minister one day, um, and we made these promises to one another. 
we said uh, we stood in front of, uh, of the minister in a hall just like this and uh, full of people. And we promised one another. We promised to have and to hold. We promised uh, for better or for worse. We promised for richer or poor in sickness and in health. Uh, to have and to love and to cherish one another until death do us part. Now I wish that I could stand here and say uh, that I'm 100% certain that uh, I'll fulfill those promises. Uh, you know, I wish I could tell you. I wish I could tell you that. Uh, but her and I both, we rely on God's power and grace uh, through our marriage. Um, you see, what makes a, a promise really solid is not only the willingness of the promise giver, uh, but the promise giver must have the power to fulfill that promise. Right? Promise giver must have the power to fulfill that promise. And many uh, have, uh, for many, it's proven a difficult thing to do uh, to keep their marriage vows till death do them part. In our passage today, God makes uh, a similarly difficult promise to Abraham and Sarah. He's made a, a very difficult promise. Um, to a promise of a child and a descendant. Um, it's not the first time that he's made this promise. He's made this promise since chapter 12. We're in chapter 18. The first time he made this promise was in chapter 12. Uh, we're catching the story almost at the back end. Um, there the Lord makes a promise to Abram, uh, as he was known back then, before he changed his name to Abraham. God changed his name to Abraham. He made him a threefold promise, and he said he would give Abraham... Firstly, uh, land. He said he'll give Abraham, uh, that Abraham would become a great nation. He'll give him a, a child, a descendant. Um, he said that he would bless Abraham so that he could be a blessing to other families. Notice that without a descendant and without a child, the other two promises really don't make any sense, do they? Um, the promise of a child or the promise of a descendant is kind of the biggest it's kind of a big deal, probably the biggest one of them all. But we're told <laughs> Sarai is barren. They don't have children. They've never had children. They're too old to have children. First prize if you can spot the difficulty there. Genesis 15, after some time, probably years, God appears to Abraham, Abraham again, and he renews this promise. This time he renews it with a kind of, a, uh, uh, you know, with a ritual attached to it, you know. Um, it's got a ritual attached this time. He tells Abram to look up at the stars, and he tells them this is the number of, uh, you know, descendants that I'll give you. Uh, he tells him to lie down while he speaks to him through a dream, uh, telling him about uh, this promise. And this kind of ritual sort of intensifies this promise. Like, like God is really making this promise solid. He's really telling Abraham, hey Abraham, I'll do this. Uh, problem? Sarai is still barren. Still not sure. Not even a prospect of children to be barren, right? Not even a hope. The person who stands to, to earn Abraham's estate is a guy by the name of uh, Eliezer uh, of Damascus. He is a slave. <laughs> he is Abraham's servant. Well, actually, not a slave, but he's a servant. He's the one who stands in line uh, to get uh, Abraham's estate. So Genesis 16, Abraham is now 86 years of age. Years have passed since the promise. And Sarai... <laughs> is convinced that the Lord has kept her from having children. And um, so God is too slow. God is too slow. They need to solve this problem. And so they come up with a plan. Uh, the plan is to have uh, one of Sarah's servants, Hag Hagar, to have the child with Abraham. After all, the promise was made to Abraham. Sarah wasn't there when God made the promise to Abraham. Um, and so they have, uh, so Abraham has a child with Sarai, 
I mean, sorry, not with Sly, with Sarai's slave, Hagar. And Ishmael is born. You'll remember Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn. But Sarai is left out of the promise. <laughs> is this what God really wants? Is this what God really planned? As it turns out, trying to, trying to help God to fulfill the promises that he made doesn't turn out pretty well. Now there's a competitor for Abraham's estate. There's a competitor for Abraham's um, inheritance from God. Yet another problem that God must solve. <laughs> Genesis 17, God repeats the promise. And this time he makes it absolutely clear that you will have a son. And this son will be um, uh, by none other than your wife, Sarah. Sarah will be the mother of nations, not Hagar. Abram laughs in response. You know, he knows he's old. He's like, won't, well, won't you just, you know, why don't you just take uh, uh, Ishmael? He's already there. But God won't have it. And 25 years later, Ishmael, 13 years of age, we get to Genesis 18. Sarah, now her name is changed, and, uh, and Abraham's name is changed. He's now Abraham and Sarah. Sarai is Sarah. God has changed their name, linking with the promise in Genesis 17. It says Sarah is still without a child. Sarah is still barren. 25 years later. Promise hasn't arrived. It's the longest time you've ever waited for someone to fulfill a promise. I bet you never waited 25 years. I bet you never waited that long. We're left with a question. <laughs> Where's God? <laughs> Is God powerful enough to fulfill his promise? It's a question we're often faced with during difficult times, isn't it? Where is God? When we've hit difficult times, we believe that God, um, uh, God will do one thing with our lives, and here in front of us, we've got just another. You know, we've got the hope that our lives will look a certain way. When we look at our lives, it's completely different. Where is God? We don't want to feel like we're experiencing the, the blessing of God. Preachers love to say this. They love to say that there's two scenarios in life. It's either you're, um, you're heading, uh, you're in difficult times. Uh, it's either you're heading into difficult times or you're getting out of difficult times. <laughs> there's two scenarios of life. Difficult times are inevitable, isn't it? It's especially those hard times, friends that we need to hold on to God's promises and not forsake them. In the passage that we have uh, in front of us today, um, that Jace read for us, um, we learn that it's Abraham's disposition to God, Abraham's disposition and generosity towards the Lord um, uh, that, that God that gives an opportunity for the blessing of God. So it's Abraham's disposition and generosity towards the Lord that gives opportunity for the blessing of God. I'd like us to look at this using uh, three, uh, two subheadings. Um, we're going to look firstly at uh, Abraham's, uh, Abraham's generosity, and then we'll look at uh, God's promise and Sarah's doubt. Okay, we're going to look at uh, Abraham's generosity. And then we'll look at God's promise and Sarah's doubt. So let's read in Genesis uh, 18, verse 1 to 2. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mama. While he was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the heat of day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried to the entrance of his tent to meet them. And he bowed down, and, uh, bowed down low to the ground. Can you see that attitude towards these mysterious visitors? 
The story is being told from Abraham's uh, sort of vantage point. And uh, the phrase that he, that he looked up sort of emphasizes uh, Abraham's vantage point. It emphasizes uh, 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 the seeing part of Abraham. Um, the seeing part and takes our attention from Abraham himself and to these three visitors. This is a theophany. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what a theophany is. A theophany is when God in the Old Testament appears um, appears in the, in the form of a person. Okay, there's a few times that God does that. Um, this is it. These three men appear. Uh, it's, it's, it looks like it's, uh, one of them is the Lord. And we see from verse 1. One of them is the Lord and two angels. Whether Abraham knows this, it isn't clear. Okay, it isn't clear. Uh, to him, these are strangers. But you can see due to the way that he sort of comes and he runs to them and he bows down low and he welcomes them. Abraham sort of consents that this is not just a normal, you know, this is not a normal moment, right? He perceives the moment. This hospitable attitude uh, of Abraham um, is a symbol of his righteousness. How do we know this? We know this because the visitors are actually not going to Abraham. They're actually on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and there, in Sodom and Gomorrah, this litmus test, the litmus test of hospitality, uh, shows how wicked that city is. They're going to investigate the city of, of, of Sodom and Gomorrah because the cries about that city have gone up to God and God has heard them. They're going to investigate. Um, and so the litmus test of hospitality is one that tells um, that that city is wicked. So what Abraham is doing here is not insignificant. And these two stories, the Sodom and Gomorrah story and this one, sort of mirror one another. And we'll see how that that plays out. Um, so uh, what Abraham's doing here is not insignificant. From uh, verses three to eight, we can see how, you know, how generous he is, you know, uh, towards these visitors. You know, if I found favor in your eyes, they say, he says to them. He said, "A little, let a little water be brought. Uh, you'll wash your feet. Uh, uh, let me get you something to eat. Refresh yourselves." Well, then you'll be on your way. Very well, they say, uh, to Abraham. And um, Abraham, what Abraham does, we see, is that he under-promises, verses 7 and 8. He under-promises and over-delivers on his hospitality. He under-promises and over-delivers on his hospitality. This is his disposition towards the Lord. This is astounding generosity. Uh, you might call this kitchen sink. Uh, you might call this kitchen sink religion. You might call this faith in overalls. Uh, you know, a combination of of uh, of grace and groceries. Uh, you might call this. Uh, for Abraham, it's been twenty five years of waiting for a promise. No fulfillment of the promise. Yet, can you see his disposition? Can you see his attitude towards the Lord? It's welcoming. It's lavish. In service. And it's warm. His urgency shows us this much. That he perceives this moment. So he shows us, <laughs> he shows us that he anticipates that he's, these aren't just normal guests. These aren't just ordinary guests. Verse 6, he hurried. Uh, he said to Sarah, quickly, quickly. He didn't walk. He ran to the herd. Um, and the servant hurried to prepare the calf. Look at the choice of foods. In verse 7, it says it's a generous amount of the finest flour. Not the, not the normal flour, the everyday flour that you use, Sarah, to cook our bread. Choose the finest flour. It's a tender calf that he chose. Not the, for those of you who enjoy meat, will know how beef, uh, how hard and how tough it can be. But he chooses the tender calf, the young calf, you know. And meat, 
uh, will also know that it's not an everyday thing, just like in that culture. So for Abraham to actually choose meat is very significant. It's very extravagant. Um, you know, meat is something that they have once in a while. But here, Abraham chooses to give these guys meat. And then he waited on them. And then he waited on him uh, while they were eating. What generosity. What warmth. 25 years of waiting for a promise. And his attitude towards God, it hasn't changed, friends. His attitude towards God hasn't changed. Yes, he struggles. Abraham and Sarah struggle with the fact that God hasn't, hasn't fulfilled their promise. Um, Ishmael is evidence of that, isn't it? Ishmael is evidence that uh, there's a struggle for them to wait on the Lord. It's a struggle. They struggle with their circumstances of not having a child. Is this really possible? Not having a child to inherit your estate in those days is really, really dire. Actually, it was a dire circumstance. You know, um, it was seen as a, as a judgment of God in those circ- in, the, in, 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 in those in those days. It it means that God doesn't favor you. God actually doesn't favor you. You know, times are tough for Abraham and Sarah, but Abraham remains generous and warm in his disposition towards God. Tough times, friend, often lead us to forsake God, hey, isn't it? When those thoughts come into our head, those thoughts, can God possibly exist? I'm facing such a hard time. Why is God not doing anything? Why is God quiet? If God exists, then he's probably a liar or is a fraud. You know, our kitchen sink Christianity sort of goes all the way out the window. It becomes a burden to us. Friends, it's in those hard times that our disposition and our attitude to the Lord ought not change. When we need to hold onto the promises of God in the Bible. It's that time. God will strengthen you. God will give you rest. God will take care of your needs. God will work out everything for your good. God will be with you. God will protect you. Those are the promises of God. And when you're going through hard times... It's not the time to forsake them. It's not the time to forsake them. We don't give up. We don't just give up on prayer. We don't just give up on meeting together here at church. We don't just, when the times are hard, we don't just give up on Bible study. You don't just give up on Christian service. Yes, you may struggle. And friends, struggling is not a sin. You may struggle. It isn't a sin. But by all means, keep a healthy attitude toward God and his people. Because often that is the means of grace to us. Often that's the means of grace that God uses to bless us. Keep your attitude towards God, healthy. Abraham's disposition sets up an occasion for him to receive a blessing, isn't it? Uh, In contrast to the Sodomite's sinful attitude towards God, that sets up an occasion for judgment. In chapter 19, just the following chapter, the scene of um, Sodom and Gomorrah. So the Sodomites actually... uh, these visitors, as they get there, the two angels, they get to the city and, and sort of Lot is there to actually welcome them. And he does do exactly the same thing that Abraham does. He welcomes these visitors to Sodom and, and, he, and he offers them a meal. 
and a place to rest. But soon after he does that, the men of the city sort of come and surround Lot's house and they demand for these visitors to get out. They demand for these visitors to come out. And why do they want them to come out? So that they might rape them. You see the litmus test of hospitality. They want to rape these visitors. And this shows the wickedness of that city. But hold on to God's promises, friends. They are the means of grace. Hold on. Keep a healthy attitude towards God and his people. God is a promise keeper. He's a way maker. As we see in this next scene. So in Genesis 18, 9 to 15, what happens there? He says, uh, where is Sarah, your wife? Uh, he asked him. The Lord finally speaks in this passage. Uh, where is Sarah, your wife? And then one of them said, I'll surely. And then one of them, uh, the men now sitting here, says, surely I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah will have a wife. I'm sorry, will have a son. Sarah will have a son. Um, and the Lord knows that Sarah's probably sitting in the tent, is probably, which is near them here. Um, the Lord knows that she's listening in, and he says, where's Sarah, your wife? This is probably a way of bringing Sarah into the conversation, and Sarah's kind of eavesdropping into this, into this conversation, and the Lord knows that. And uh, you'll have a son, and the promise is date-stamped, isn't it? So now, finally, after 25 years, we know that this time next year, Sarah will have a child. Sarah will have a child. And everything that's happened up till now um, has kind of been a build-up to this moment. This is the crescendo moment. Um, uh, Sarah is definitely part of the promise. This is the crescendo moment of the story, the sort of climax of the story. But it's set against Sarah's doubt. This scene reminds me um, a little bit of what happens back home. So back in my village, when I, when I was growing up, uh, you know, we'd go home uh, to the village um, with the family. And uh, what would happen that the next day when we're there, some of our neighbors would see that our car's there. So we haven't been there maybe for about three months or four months, whatever, that, you know, whatever the case may be. And some of the neighbors will see, oh, they're here. And what will happen is that, um, uh, is that there'll be just neighbors coming into our house uh, and just sitting there by the shade, you know, not saying anything, just, just chilling, sitting, talking to one another. Obviously, we won't ignore that. And so my dad would say to, uh, to my mom, uh, won't you make something? And uh, he would send me to go and, uh, and buy some beers. And then I'd hurry along, go get beers, come back, and I'd place these uh, uh, with, the, with the meal that mom has prepared. And, uh, and uh, guess what they do is one of the elders would stand up uh, at that moment and kind of just thank, them, thank my dad. You know, it's a sign of generosity. And he would call him by all his clan names, you know. It's just, just giving that honor and that bestowing that blessing upon his family and his children for his generosity. It's a similar thing in this culture. In this culture, after guests have received this generosity, they, they stand up and they, and they convey blessing. Um, in return for what, for the generosity. That's what happens here. So the Lord in verse, in verses 10 promises, uh, makes, uh, makes a promise that they will surely return next year as a blessing in recognition of Abraham's generosity here. The promise is date stamped, as I said, but Sarah struggles, still struggles with doubt. The Lord hears this and he rebukes her. And the key question that is asked after 25 years of waiting, 25 years of struggling. You know, Sarah, Sarah has given up 13 years ago. That's how old Ishmael is. 13 years ago. 
And the key question is, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And that's the question that comes to you this morning. If you're facing things, something, going through something today, the question is posed to you. Is anything too hard for the Lord? So does God have the power to fulfill what he promised? It's a question, right? It's an odd question to ask. God displays his, displayed his power at the beginning of this very book. At the very beginning of this very book in Genesis, God displayed his power. God created, created something out of nothing. Is that an easy thing to do? God created this universe with all its complex processes and systems out of absolutely nothing. Will he now struggle to create a son for Abraham and Sarah? Really? Will he struggle to fulfill a promise that he's made, that he made, a covenant that he made, not once, not twice, but three times to Abraham? Question, friends, doesn't need an answer. It's a ridiculous notion to begin with. No. God, nothing is hard for the Lord. Similarly, we get a clue in chapter 19 that, not, that God answers his promises. After that, after that scene where the Sodomites want to, um, uh, Sodomites want to treat uh, angels in that way. God promises to judge them. God promises to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happens? Quite immediately, Sodom and Gomorrah are reduced to ashes. Entire cities are reduced to ashes by flames Flaming balls coming out of heaven. It rained fire on them quite immediately, saving one person who had hospitality towards the angels. That was Lot. Does God fulfill his promises? The Sodomites will tell you, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Do we have reason to believe that God will fulfill his promises? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. He fulfills his promises. His promises of blessing. He also fulfills his promises of judgment. The crisis of Abraham and Sarah was childlessness. You know. And God fixed that. If you go and read chapter chapters 20 of Genesis 21. But what might your crisis be this morning? What might your crisis be this morning? Is it pressure at work? Is it finances? Is it a family crisis? Is it addiction to something? What threatens your faith? What is it that's in the horizon of your life that you fear deeply? You know, my wife uh, alerted me to an article a few weeks back that spoke about the trouble that the middle class is in in South Africa. It says that they did some research and they found found that 80% of the middle class in South Africa spend their salary within five days of getting paid. They, sorry, I said that wrong. Um, the middle class spend 80% of their salary within five days of getting paid. 80% of their salary within five days of getting paid. They literally survive the next 25 days on 5% of their salary. 
COVID has only increased the pressure with medical bills. Petrol price is now 24 bucks a liter. You know, when the petrol price increases, it means that everything else goes up with it. You know, from the taxi fare to the groceries that we buy at ShopRite and Checkers. Because now it costs more to get those goods <laughs> to the store where we buy them, from the farms, from the warehouses. So it affects everyday people like you and I. And it gets difficult to make ends meet. And we, you may wonder, where is God? Where is God? It's no wonder people are having crises of faith. When we look at the problems that, that people face. And sometimes what we do really crazy things to get ourselves out of problems, don't we? We try to solve the, the, uh, solve the issue. We try to, to, uh, to help God. And we try to help God in ways that make us, that put us worse, in worse situations. Rather turn, we turn away from God's promises and turn to things like drugs and alcohol. We cheat clients for a buck. We lie, we steal. We do crazy things. Friends, if that's you this morning, I do want to encourage you. I want to encourage you by saying this. The question, the question is anything too hard for God is more than just a promise to play. It's it's an attribute. It's an attribute to embrace. A hope that sustains us during hard times. It's a hope that sustains us during hard times. Because I want you to know this, and this is very serious. Because sometimes we think we can tell God which hard thing he must do for us. Sometimes God doesn't change our circumstances. Sometimes God won't change our circumstances for the mere fact that he is God and we are not. We don't know the reasons. God might not change our circumstance, but we will grow through them, isn't it? Sometimes God wants us to grow towards him towards him more by giving us challenges. I saw a, a video clip the other day. It said that sometimes God gives people easy, the easiest of times because the, oh, the devil lets people have the easiest of times because he doesn't want anybody crying to God. And so these people are, are in a prison. But this prison is so comfortable. It's a prison of nice things, of good times, but they don't see a need to get out. Now, friends, sometimes God, the hard thing that God will do is to help us to accept our circumstances and heal our spirits so that we might still continue to flourish as people till the day we meet him. So I've got a friend. Um, his name is Quezzy. And uh, my friend, uh, I, you know, we went to church together while I was still in high school. We grew up together. We got out of high school. We went to, um, to varsity together. We did the same course. Um, and a few years back, my friend got into an accident that rendered him... Um, uh, you know, without legs, both of them. And rendered him a double amputee. A very, very difficult time for everybody who was around him. This idea that he'll never walk again. And, um, 
And, and I could tell him this. I could have told him this. I could have told him, crazy, there's nothing too hard for God. He can give you back your legs. I mean, God can. God can. But that's not what pro- God's probably going to do. See, the hard thing that God can do, the other hard thing that God can do, is to help crazy, to accept his circumstance, and to heal his spirit so that crazy flourishes through life even without his legs. See, friends, we're not at liberty to tell God which hard thing he will do. We're not at liberty to tell God which hard thing he will do. So is anything too difficult for the Lord? What is harder to come back from than coming back from the dead? Is there anything harder than coming back from the grave? I'll wait. And yet that's exactly what our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, did. He came back from the dead. And that's the God we serve. The God who fulfills his promises. The God who fulfills promises and is the doer of hard things. That's the God we serve. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose up again from the dead. You see, that's the promise of the resurrection, isn't it? The promise of the resurrection says that because Christ rose, I will rise again from the dead. That's the promise of Christianity. Uh, a guy by the name of Thomas Watson once said this. He said, we are more certain to rise from the grave than we are certain of rising from our beds tomorrow morning. That's the promise of the resurrection. That's the promise. If you're a Christian today, that's the promise for you. He said, we are more certain to rise from our graves than we are certain to rise from our beds tomorrow morning. That's the hope that holds us through hard times. So is anything too difficult from the Lord, for the Lord? Friends, it's a ridiculous notion to begin with. And if you're not a Christian this morning, my invitation is for you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for coming. Why don't you, why don't you take this promise, this promise for you. You know that the world out there is full of empty promises. You know this. This is a promise This is a sure promise of the resurrection because God, Jesus, has already done it himself. He is the first fruit. Maybe this promise can be yours. Two. Why don't we pray? Father, we we thank you. You are such a great, great God. What an awesome God. What an awesome privilege to be able to hold on to this kind of promise. Though, Lord, we're facing hard times. In fact, God, you never promised that there will be no hard times. In fact, I remember you promising differently in John. And you're saying that, behold, 
you will, telling your disciples, behold, you will face hard times in this world. But saying and encouraging them, encouraging us to be of good strength because you have overcome this world. Lord, you've overcome this world by rising from the dead. By remaining completely sinless and rising, rising for the dead so that we could rise. Won't you catch, capture us up into that promise? Make us excited. Warm our hearts with this promise and help our attitudes towards you never to change, though we see the hard times in front of us. Won't you uphold us? Won't you keep us right to the end? In Jesus' name we pray.